Yo, 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 physics, 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 physics. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about kinematics and its concepts. The very first thing that I'm going to be talking about are basic definitions. If a particle is traveling from point A to point B, the length of the path taken is called the distance. This length would be the distance traveled. And if you draw the straight vector from A to B, that vector will be your displacement vector. So these are the basic definitions of displacement vector and the distance. Average velocity. So velocity is a vector. Average velocity is defined as the displacement divided by the time taken. And average speed is defined as the distance traveled divided by the total time taken to travel that distance. And what about average acceleration? Average acceleration, again a vector is defined as the change in velocity vector. So let's say v vector is the final velocity vector, u vector is the initial velocity vector divided by the time taken. So v is the final velocity and u vector is the initial velocity all in vector. So average acceleration is defined as a change in velocity vector divided by the time taken. In physics, remember, change always means final minus initial. All right, so let's do a couple of questions based on these concepts. I'll go to the next page. So here I have a question. Uh, let's just quickly read this. A body covers one third of its journey with speed v naught. The remaining portion of the distance was covered with velocity v1 for half of the remaining time and with velocity v2 for the other half of the remaining time. So one third of the journey is covered with speed v0 and the two thirds of the journey that is remaining in that half the time was covered with speed v1 and the other half was covered with speed v2. Assuming the body always travels in a straight line, find the average velocity of the body over the whole journey. So let's try this question. So let's say particle is traveling along this straight line from point A to point B. Let's say this is point C. Uh, let's say the distance is L between A and B. So it covers one third of the journey with speed V0. So let's say that the time from A to B is uh, capital T. So what I want is average velocity. See here average velocity, the, mag uh, the question is asking is the magnitude of the average velocity that is understood from the question. Uh, the particle is only traveling in a straight line. So the distance traveled and the magnitude of the displacement is all the same. So here I want my average velocity would simply be, I'm talking about the magnitude, would be the displacement L divided by the time taken. So I want L by T. Alright, so um, what will be the time from A to C? That time would be the distance L by 3 divided by the speed V0. And therefore, the time from C to B would be the total time T minus the time from A to C. Now, this time that we have calculated here that the particle takes from uh, C to B, half of that time was traveled with speed V1. So let me uh, mark this point D such that from C to D the speed is V1 and from D to B the speed is V2. Now the time taken from C to D is half of this, time taken from D to B is also half of this. Alright, so what will be the distance from uh, C to B? This distance would be from C to D, see CB I can write it as CD plus DB. I know CB is equal to 2L by 3 and uh, CD will be equal to the speed V1 multiplied by the time taken from C to D which is half of this value. Plus what will be the distance from D to B? The speed V2 multiplied by the time taken from D to B which is again half of this value. So V2 by 2 times. T minus L by 3 V0. 
all right now it's a very simple case of just taking all the l values on one side so what you will get is just gather all the l values on one side and all the t values on the other side so you will get something times l is equal to something times t now this calculation is something that i'm going to leave it up to you and then you can calculate l by t which is your average velocity so your answer here is going to come out to be 3 v0 times v1 plus v2 divided by v1 plus v2 plus 4 v0 so this is uh, i would say a little difficult type of question uh, covering the concepts of average uh, velocity average speed so this is another question very uh, similar to the previous question uh, slightly different but the process will be very similar so i'm going to suggest that you stop the video right now and uh, if you have understood the previous question then uh, you try this question out and uh, then check with my solution if you've gotten it correct all right so i'm going to follow the same process that i did in the previous question i have a particle that is traveling from let's say a to b now what does the question say a body moving in a straight line covers a certain distance uh, one fifth of the time is covered with a speed v1 all right so uh, let's say the total time taken from a to b is capital t and the length ab is l once again i want to find the average speed so i want to find l by t that is what i want to find all right so uh, the question says that one fifth of the time is covered with speed v1 so let's say the time taken from a to c is one fifth of the total time so t by 5 and it's covered with uh, a speed of v1 now Three fourth of the remaining distance. So CB is the remaining distance, and three fourth of that is covered with speed V2. So let's say I have a point D here. So the speed from C to D is V2, and the one fourth of the remaining distance, so from D to B, is covered with speed V3. All right. So the time taken from uh, a to c is t by 5 so what is the length of ac can i write ac as the speed times the time taken and therefore cb would be the total length ab which is l minus ac and cd is nothing but 3 fourth of cb so cd would be 3 fourth of l minus v1 t by 5 so how much time does the particle take from c to d that will simply be cd divided by v2 and what about uh, 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 db similar analysis db would be one fourth of cb and therefore one fourth of l minus v1 t by 5 so what will be the time taken from d to b just db divided by v3 and what about the total time from c to b if the time taken from a to c is t by 5 time taken from c to b would be 4t by 5 because the total time is t so can i write 4t by 5 is equal to the time taken from c to d cd by v2 plus time taken from d to b db by v3 now all you have to do is substitute cd and db here and that's it once again gather all the l terms on one side gather all the capital t terms on the other side and just get the value of l by t so i'm going to leave the calculation once again up to you it's it's just very basic algebra and you should get your value as 16 v2 v3 plus 3 v1 v3 plus v1 v2 divided by 15 v3 plus 5v2 so these kind of questions uh, look a little complicated but if you do it methodically they are pretty straightforward in the end you're just uh, dealing with a little bit of algebra which you should be pretty comfortable with now let's look at uniform acceleration motion
So in uniform acceleration, I can write acceleration is a constant. So I can just write it as final minus initial velocity divided by t. So this gives me my equation v is equal to u plus a t. If you integrate this equation, I'll get the displacement, which will be u t plus half a t square. Note that all these quantities s u v a are all vectors. T is of course time, which is a scalar. So these are my two equations and the third equation uh, I would write it in component form. So if I write it in along the x-axis, vx square would be equal to ux square plus 2ax sx. So what is v here? Final velocity, u is initial velocity, a is acceleration, s is the displacement and these are all the x components. Similarly, you can write the same equation in the y component and the same for the z component. If you actually add up all of these, you should be able to see that the left hand side would be vx square plus vy square plus vz square which is nothing but v square. The right hand side similarly would be u square plus ax sx plus ay sy plus az sz. Can you see that is nothing but the dot product. So in vector form you can write the third equation of motion in this manner v square is u square plus 2 a dot s. Another important equation is that the displacement can be written as v plus u by 2 times t. You can just check that by substituting uh, v here and you'll get your second equation. So uh, this tells us that the average velocity which is defined as displacement by the time taken is nothing but the mean of the initial and the final velocity. So this works only for uniform acceleration motion. Do not use the average velocity is final plus initial by 2 for any other situation. It only works for uniform acceleration motion. Remember that. Alright, so let's take a look at a question uh, based on uniform acceleration motion. So in a car race, car A takes time T less than car B and passes the finishing point with velocity V more than car B. And both cars start from rest and travel with uniform accelerations AB, AA and AB respectively find V by T. Alright, so I would encourage you to pause the video and give it a try using the equations that we learnt on the previous slide. Alright, so uh, you have two cars travelling from let's say point 1 to point 2. Let's say the displacement from 1 to 2 is S. So for the car A, can I write that uh, because it starts from rest, VA, the final velocity when it reaches point 2, VA squared would be equal to U squared plus 2 AS, U is 0 because they are starting from rest. So 2 A acceleration of A times S. And similarly, I can write the same for car B, VB square is 2 A B times S. They both have the same displacement. They are starting of course from the same point and ending at the same point. Uh, in the race. And what about the time taken? So because initial velocity is 0, can I write the displacement would be ut plus half at square u is 0. So for car A, can I write it as half acceleration of A times the time taken by A. So that means T A would be and similarly I can write T B directly as this. So now it's just a case of the uh, information that is given and let's use that. So uh, the, uh, the question says that car A takes time T lesser than car B. So can I write the time taken by B minus time taken by A is equal to uh, T. So I can write root 2S by AB minus root 2S by AA is equal to T. This is one equation. And the other equation is that uh, they pass the finishing point with velocity v. So car A passes the finishing point with velocity v more than car B. So car A has a greater velocity compared to car B. So I can write V A minus V B is V and V A from this equation is root 2 A A S minus root 2 A B S should be equal to V. This is my second equation. And now what is the question asking? The question is asking V by T. So basically we just divide 2 by 1. That will give me V by T. 
and uh, my answer you should see that root root 2s will cancel out when i divide v by t so i will be left with root a a minus root a b divided by 1 by root a b minus 1 by root a a and just uh, cross multiply in the denominator and you should be able to get your answer as root a a times a b so this is your final answer i hope you were also able to get this and if not you were able to understand the solution we just use our basic equations of motion in such questions if you ever get stuck just write down all the equations you know and then you pick and choose from your equations based on what you want now here i have a free fall question so in free fall the acceleration is going to be a constant g vector uh, which is of course downwards vertically downwards so let's just uh, read the question first a stone falling from top of a vertical tower has descended x meters when another is let fall from a height y below the top and they both fall from rest and reach the ground together and the question is asking us to find the height of the tower so i'll just draw the diagram i have a i have a tower here and the first stone is for is uh, dropped from the top of a vertical tower and when it travels a distance x another stone is dropped from a distance y below the top of the tower and then they both reach at the same time so the question is asking us to find the uh, height of the tower now if i say that the height of the tower is h what will be the time taken by the first stone to reach the ground the first stone has to travel a displacement of h so can i write uh, h is the displacement in the downward direction initial velocity is zero so i can just write ut plus half at square acceleration is g vector so can i just write half gt squared so everything is i have taken downward as positive positive y axis if you want so displacement is positive h acceleration is positive g and therefore this is for the first uh, stone so t1 would be root 2h by g where uh, h is the displacement of the first stone now uh, let's also figure out when was the second stone released the second stone was released when the first stone traveled a distance x now we found out the time taken to travel distance h was root 2h by g so let's say the second stone is after time t dash after uh, the first stone is released so t dash will be the time taken by the first stone to travel a distance x so can i say that t dash would be equal to root 2x by g just instead of h i have replaced x all right then the second stone travels how much distance it's released from y from the top of the tower and the entire height is h so can i say this will be h minus y so the second stone is taking a time let's say t2 now the distance traveled is h minus y so root of twice of h minus y by g this will be the time taken by the second stone to reach the ground now can i just say it should be very obvious that t dash plus t2 should be equal to t1 t1 is the time taken from the release of the first stone till the point where the first stone reaches the ground t dash is the time when the second stone is released and after t dash time the second stone takes another t2 time to reach the ground and since both of them reach the ground simultaneously as is given in the question i can just say t1 is equal to t dash plus t2 so my equation would be root 2h by g is equal to root 2x by g plus root of twice of h minus y by g so now uh, this is not a difficult equation you must have encountered such type of equations in uh, algebra but let's just solve this on the next page so my equation was root 2h by g is equal to root 2x by g plus root of h minus y by g 
so of course uh, root of 2 by g can 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 get cancelled out on both sides now my equation is root h is equal to root x plus root of h minus y so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this on one side and then i'm going to square them so i'll have h plus x minus 2 root h x should be equal to h minus y so h gets cancelled out on both sides and i'll have x plus y is equal to 2 root h x and then again square it and therefore i get h as x plus y the whole square divided by 4 x and that is your answer that is the height of the tower so i hope you've understood how we did a question on free fall now a similar type of question uh, as the previous question so just uh, pause the video give it a try and then you can take a look at my solution okay so the question says a stone is dropped from the top of tall tower and after one second another stone is dropped from a balcony 20 meters below the top if both stones reach the ground at the same instant calculate the height of the tower so it's very similar to the previous question let's take a look so once again i have a tower and let's say the height is h a stone is dropped from the top of the tower and uh, so let's say it reaches the ground in time t1 so i can once again write h is equal to half g t1 squared where h is the displacement uh, of the stone in the uh, in the positive direction which i have taken as downwards and acceleration is also positive g so t1 would be equal to root 2 h by g all right uh, so when is the second stone dropped if i say that the first stone is dropped at t equal to 0 the second stone is therefore dropped at t equal to 1 dropped from a height of 20 meters below the top as is given in the question so it will have a displacement of h minus 20 so can i say the time taken by the second stone would be root of twice of h minus 20 by g and because they both reach at the same time can i say that t1 minus t2 is equal to 1 because the second stone was dropped one second after the first stone was dropped now it's just uh, basic algebra so i'll have my equation of root to h by g minus root of h minus 20 by g should be equal to 1. Once again, uh, this is just a little bit of algebra. Just take uh, one of these terms on the other side and square it. So, um, if you've understood till this point, I suggest that uh, you can try it out. Uh, try this final calculation out. I'll anyway do it on the next page. So, my equation is root 2 h by g minus root of h minus 20 by g is equal to 1. So, I'll have I'm going to square them. So, I'll have 2h by g plus 1 plus 2 root 2h by g is equal to twice of h minus 20 by g. I've just squared both sides. So, there should be a negative sign here. Alright, so I'm just going to uh, cancel out 2h by g on both sides. You can see that. And therefore, I'll have 1 minus 2 root 2h by g is equal to uh, minus 40 by g so uh, the question said g value is 10 meter per second squared so I have 1 minus uh, 2 root 2h two by 10 is equal to minus 4 so 5 is equal to uh, 2 root h by 5 to square again 25 is 4 times uh, h by 5 and therefore h is 125 by 4 which will come out to be i mean that's your answer you can just write it in decimal form as well 31.25 meters and that is your answer so that's the height of the tower so i hope you've understood how we solved uh, these kind of free fall questions Let's look at uh, projectile motion now. So, projectile motion is when you have a particle which is thrown at an angle to the uh, horizontal and 
it performs a parabolic path so this path the trajectory that it takes is parabolic so if my if i just write down my velocity vector as u cos theta i cap plus u sin theta j cap the particle is in free fall so that means the force on it is only gravity and the acceleration will therefore be in the vertical vertically downward direction i can write it as minus g j cap because i have taken y axis as positive upwards so acceleration is minus g j cap so this is the initial velocity as well as the uh, acceleration you can see the acceleration is uniform everywhere and therefore i can use all my equations v equal to u plus at s equal to u t plus rt square and the third equation here uh, you can calculate the time of flight so time of flight is basically the time to land back again on the ground if you set displacement y component to be zero because ultimately the net displacement is going to be in the horizontal direction so once you write down u y t plus half a y t squared where capital t is the time of flight and you can just solve this and you'll get uh, 2 u y by minus a y and a y itself is minus g and therefore the time of flight would be 2 u sin theta by g so this is the time of flight uh, whenever in such questions you have time you are asked time of flight in kinematics especially in almost all cases usually you can get the time of flight just by looking at the displacement not not just in projectile because usually you know uh, the displacement from the situation or from the question so look at the displacement and uh, use utp is half t square to get the time of flight it works most of the time all right uh, then what about the maximum height attained that comes out to be u square sin square theta by 2g just by setting the y component of velocity to be zero at that point and then you can use a third equation to get the height and what about the range the range r uh, is very simple you just uh, realize that there is no acceleration in the horizontal direction so the horizontal displacement which is the range will simply be horizontal velocity multiplied by the time and you can just get this as u square sin 2 theta by g so these are the three basic equations that you should remember for projectile motion now if you look at the range u square sin 2 theta by g it is of course a maximum when theta becomes 45 degrees that's when sin 2 theta will become 1 right so the maximum range would be equal to u square by g this is assuming that the speed of projectile is constant remember that if the speed is a variable then of course you will have to take into account the speed the varying speed as well as the varying angle another important point is that the range is same when you uh, when the when the angles of projection are complementary complementary means the sum is 90 degrees so if you throw at an angle of uh, 30 degrees and you throw at an angle of 60 degrees with the same speed of course you will get the same range because sin 2 theta value will be the same now if i talk about the equation of trajectory the equation of trajectory is basically just an equation between the x and y coordinates a relation between the x and y coordinates so this comes out to be a parabola trajectory and the equation and the equation comes out to be equal to y equal to x tan theta minus gx square by 2u square cos square theta so this is my equation of trajectory where u is the initial speed theta is the angle of projection and g is of course the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity another form of this equation of trajectory is if you take x tan theta as common you should be able to see that this comes out to be 1 minus x pi r where r is the range this expression so these are the two forms of the equation of trajectory whenever you don't need time then equation of trajectory is helpful let's also talk about the speed of a particle as it uh, travels uh, along the parabolic path so between any two points if i have speed v1 and speed v2 and the height Uh, the height difference between the two points is h 
I can write v2 squared is equal to v1 squared minus 2gh. So this you can prove using kinematics, using the third equation of motion or you can even use energy conservation. Energy conservation you should be able to see very clearly half mv2 square is a kinetic energy at the uh, higher point plus mgh should be equal to the initial kinetic energy at, at uh, point 1 and you can just uh, get this equation. So this is a useful relation in some questions where you don't want to uh, take into account the time taken but rather the vertical height ascended or descended. So in terms of the vertical height you can have a relation between the speeds. And also what will be the relation between the angles here. So let's say the angles with the horizontal is theta 1 and theta 2. So another useful relation is that the x component of velocity is a constant throughout the motion. By x component I mean the horizontal component. The horizontal component of the velocity is a constant throughout the motion. The reason is because the acceleration is only in the vertical direction. And therefore can I write that the initial horizontal velocity at point 1 should be equal to the horizontal component at point 2. So this is another useful relation. We look at a couple of questions which involve these equations. Alright, so in this question, um, I have a student throwing a large number of small pebbles in all possible directions with equal speeds u out of a window. The pebbles hit the horizontal ground moving at an angle theta or greater with the ground. So the question says that the pebbles are hitting the ground with angle which is equal to or greater than this theta value. So there is no pebble hitting the ground at an angle lesser than theta. This angle is measured with the ground, with the horizontal. Alright, air resistance is negligible, acceleration due to gravity is g, deduce suitable expression for the height of the point of projection above the ground. So I have lots of pebbles being thrown in all directions from a window, let's say the height is h from the ground. So all these pebbles are landing on the ground with some angle, this angle. So the question states that the smallest angle is theta. So the point here is that we do not know what is the angle of projection for which you get the smallest possible angle of theta at the ground. So what we are going to do is let us consider a general situation where the speed is u at an angle let's say phi and that hits the ground with a speed let's say v and let's say this is the smallest possible angle with the ground as the question mentions. Now one thing is that I can write a relation between v and u just using the previous uh, expression on the previous slide that we got. So v squared would be equal to u squared plus 2gh this is something that we already saw on the previous slide. Now, do we have a relation between theta and phi? Yes. Once again, I'm going to use the fact that the horizontal component of velocity is a constant. So, can I write u cos phi should be equal to v cos theta. So, I'm just going to substitute v as u square plus 2gh cos theta. Now, therefore, I can express cos theta as u cos phi divided by root of u square plus 2g. Now note here that h is a constant, u is a constant. The only thing is a variable is phi. The angle phi is uh, can be anything because the question says that the uh, students throwing a uh, large number of small pebbles in all possible directions. Now the value of cos phi can be at maximum 1. So you can see that there is a limiting value on cos theta when cos phi becomes 1. So the maximum value of cos theta would mean the minimum value of theta. So for minimum value of theta, I can write cos theta as u divided by u square plus 2g. I hope you have understood what I have done here. I have set the value of cos phi to be 1 because that will mean the maximum value of cos theta and therefore the minimum value of theta. Alright, now all you have to do is just a little bit of algebra. So let me just square and take the denominator on the left hand side. So u square plus 2gh cos square theta is u squared. And then you should just solve for h. And you will get this as u square tan square theta divided by 2g. So that is your final answer, the height of the window from the ground. So this was a question from the Pathfinder book. And uh, even though 
people think the pathfinder book is a difficult book but uh, if you just do the basics uh, most of the questions are pretty straightforward let's take a look at another question a particle is projected from horizontal ground with a speed 20 meter per second at a certain angle with the horizontal so that it just clears two vertical walls of equal heights of 10 meters so you have two walls and they have the same height of 10 meters and they are at a distance horizontal distance of 20 meters from each other and find the time taken by the particle to pass between the two walls so basically i have some sort of this situation where the particle is projected and the question says it just clears two walls so these are the two walls of height uh, 10 meters each so just clears means it will just graze the top of the uh, walls and the distance between the two walls is given to us as 20 meters here. Okay, so uh, the initial speed is also given to us as 20 meter per second. However, the initial angle is unknown. The question is asking us to find the time taken by the particle to go from one wall to the other. So this red journey, that time is asked. So I would suggest that you pause the video and you give it a try now and then you can take a look at my solution. Okay, so uh, one way of doing this is using the equation of trajectory although it is the longer method. But I'll just uh, give you an outline of how you can do it. And you may have actually done this question using this. Let's say that This is my x and y coordinate. Let's say the tower is at a distance x. So the left tower, let's say it's at x comma 10. 10 is the vertical height. So can I say, uh, I'm going to use the equation of trajectory y is equal to x tan theta minus gx squared by 2u squared cos squared theta. So I'll have 10 is equal to x tan theta minus gx squared by 2u squared cos squared theta. Now, this is a quadratic in x, so that, that makes sense because you have two walls whose height is 10 meters. So, you can expect to get a quadratic in x. And the roots x1 and x2 will basically be the x coordinates of the walls. Now, when you take the uh, difference in the roots, this will be the difference in the roots. Uh, you've studied quadratic equations in math, so you can just directly get the difference in the roots. This should be equal to 20 meters. That is given in the question and uh, you will get x2 and x1 in terms of theta. Um, so basically you will get theta here. Then once you get the uh, initial angle, so the, in, this is the initial angle of projection. Once you get this, now you can calculate the time taken from one wall to the other by using an equation that involves time. So what, which equation involves time as well as the y coordinate? That is the second equation in the y direction. So I can write y is equal to u sin theta t y component of velocity initial velocity minus half gt square i've used the second equation so y coordinate is 10 meters you know u and theta and once again uh, the two time values that you will get by solving this quadratic in t you will be the times corresponding to the uh, instance when the particle is just grazing each wall and therefore the question is asking us uh, effectively the difference between the two roots. So your answer would be the uh, difference between the two roots. So this is what you will have to do in the long method. So I'm not doing the actual calculations. If you want, you can do it. You may already have actually gotten the correct answer using this long method, but let me now show you the better, the faster method. Let's go to the next page. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider, I'm going to consider the projectile only between the two walls. So let's say this uh, speed is u dash. The initial speed was 20 meter per second. Let's say this angle is phi. The angle of, uh, you can say the angle of projection at that point. Now, can I first calculate u dash? Yes, because I know the initial speed of 20 meter per second. I also know the height of this wall is 10 meters. So can I just directly write u dash square is equal to uh, initial 20 squared minus 2 gh. H is 10, g is 10. 
and therefore I get u dash square as 200. So I'll have u dash as 10 root 2. All right, now that I've gotten u dash, what else do I know about this red projectile? I know the range of this red projectile. Why? Because I have been given that that is nothing but the distance between the two walls. So remember the formula for the range. The range was u square sine 2 theta. So here it will be 2 phi by g. And my value of range is 20 meters. And u will be u dash. So I will have 20 u dash squared. I already know is 200. 200 sine 2 phi divided by 10. And therefore, I get sin 2 phi as 1 and therefore phi is nothing but equal to 45 degrees. Now that we have phi equal to 45 degrees, what is the question asking? The question is asking us to find the time taken to pass between the walls. And that for the red projectile is nothing but the time of flight. And therefore, the time of flight we already know would be 2u sin theta by g. So it's u dash sin phi by g. So what's u dash 10 root 2? What is sin 5? 1 by root 2 divided by g and therefore the answer is 2 seconds. So 2 seconds is the answer to this question. I hope you have understood the long method as well as the short method to do this question in the fastest possible manner. So let's do another question. Let's first quickly read the question. For a projectile launched from a point on a horizontal ground, the speed when it is at the greatest height is root 2 by 5 times the speed when it is at its half of its greatest height. Determine the angle of projection. So let's first draw the diagram. So let's say the initial speed is u and angle of projection is theta. Let's say the maximum height is h. At that maximum height, the speed will basically simply be the uh, x component of velocity. There is no y component of velocity and x component of velocity I know will remain a constant u cos theta. The question is saying that at height h by 2, let us say the speed is v. So the question is saying that this u cos theta is root 2 by 5 times the speed when it is at half of its greatest height which is v. So my equation is u cos theta is root of 2 by 5 times v. Now let us try and express v in terms of h and u and theta. Can I do that? Yes, I can write v squared is u squared minus 2g into the height ascended which is h by 2. So v squared is u squared minus gh. And what is the value of h? I know h is the maximum height. We have the standard formula u squared sine square theta by 2g. So all we have to do is substitute h here and then substitute v here. So let's just do that. I'm going to just square uh, this equation. So I'll have u squared cos square theta is 2 by 5 times v squared. Can I write v squared as u squared minus gh and h I'll write it as u square sine square theta by 2g. And then it is a very simple uh, equation in order to calculate theta. You may substitute cos square theta as 1 minus sine square theta. Substitute it here and uh, then the equation that you will get is 1 minus sine square theta is 2 by 5 times uh, 1 minus sine square theta by 2. Now it is a very straightforward equation and you should be able to get theta as 60 degrees. So this is the angle of projection that is asked in the question. Now let's talk about uh, oblique projectile. So oblique is basically a projectile is thrown from a height above the ground level. Let's say that height is h. It will land somewhere on the ground. So I'm going to say this is the horizontal displacement is my range. Uh, Let us say it is projected at an angle theta and a speed u. So the question can ask you to find the time taken, they can ask you to find the range, they can ask you to find the uh, angle of uh, striking the ground. So let us just quickly look at the equations that you can use here. So if I take my x-axis to the right and y-axis upwards, this is my choice. You can take y-axis downward positive as well. That is your choice. So let me just write down. Uh, first for the equation I know that the displacement has a y component of minus h. This is the displacement vector. So it has a y component of minus h because I have taken upward as positive. So positive y axis. So I will have, I am going to write displacement in y component is equal to uyt plus half 
ay t squared so sy would be minus h ui would be u sin theta times t and what about uh, acceleration the acceleration is g downwards so it will be minus g so this is how you will get your time of flight so this is the way that it's usually done in order to get the time of flight however let me just show you a faster method where you don't actually have to solve this quadratic equation anymore see if if i just denote this velocity by v i know vy is equal to uy plus ayt and therefore i can write my time of flight as vy minus uy divided by ay so uh, what is vy we know vy uh, using the third equation so i can i write vy as simply uy square plus 2gh with a negative sign because vy is will be downwards i have taken upward as positive y axis minus uy divided by so this is this will simply be uy is u square sin square theta plus 2gh plus u sin theta uy is u sin theta divided by g so that is your time of flight so i hope you understood how we don't actually have to solve the quadratic equation in order to get the time of flight in an oblique projectile we've just used the first equation and in vy we've substituted the uh, third equation so it's slightly faster uh, whatever you're comfortable with but i personally prefer uh, this method that i've shown you here without actually resorting to uh, solving a quadratic all right now what about range can i if i know the time of flight can i get the range yes i can get the range as simply the x component of velocity u cos theta multiplied by the time of flight because there is no acceleration in the x direction all right what about this value of v we already saw that v is u square plus 2 gh you can get it by the third equation or energy conservation and what about this angle phi i'll just equate the x components of velocity so i'll have v cos phi is equal to u cos theta because once again there's no acceleration in the horizontal direction and this is how you can get all these parameters now a very interesting result about this uh, horizontal range is uh, what is its maximum value and at what angle does it occur we know in ground to ground projectile the maximum the maximum range occurs at uh, an angle of projection of 45 degrees and we know how to calculate that maximum range but what about this oblique projectile so there is a very uh, very cute result for the range which you can remember and it will be very helpful in a certain type of problems uh, that we'll look at uh, later on in this lecture so first let me just go to the next slide i'll show you the uh, the value for that maximum range and then we'll prove it as well and then we'll look at its applications so if i say the initial speed is a constant but let's say this theta is a variable so you can choose whatever theta you want and i want to choose such a theta which will maximize my range on the ground the horizontal displacement i want to maximize it so the maximum horizontal displacement comes out to be equal to let's say the speed on striking the ground is v u v by g initial speed multiplied by the final speed divided by g i would suggest that you remember this it's pretty easy to remember and a certain type of problems uh, become very easy to solve uh, using this expression now let's just quickly prove this also it's not a difficult proof so basically i want to find the maximum value of r and i can throw the particle at any angle but with the constant speed so theta is a variable here and of course the height is also known to us and in the process we'll calculate the initial angle of projection as well all right so the first thing that i'm going to do in order to prove this uh, expression for the maximum range is uh, i'm going to first realize that if i fix this initial speed i automatically fix the final speed as well because i know that v squared is equal to u squared plus 2gh so u and v both are constants now both are fixed the only variable here is the angle of projection uh, because height is of course also fixed all right so i'm going to assume another variable here so let's say this initial speed is u uh, let's say the final speed so final velocity is v vector initial velocity is u vector let's say the angle between them is phi so i'm going to assume this another variable phi which is the angle between the final velocity vector here and the initial velocity vector here all right so uh, do i have a relation between v vector and u vector in vector form 
yes using the first equation can i write v vector is equal to u plus at so a vector is nothing but gt so by triangle law you should be able to see that if v vector is the sum of u vector and g vector into t g vector times t will be in this manner see we already know gt would be in the vertically downward direction because g vector is in the vertically downward direction and because of this addition of vectors uh, they will form a closed triangle in this manner. So, this is just triangle law. Alright, now what is uh, this angle? What's this angle? I know that the initial velocity makes an angle of theta with the horizontal. So, obviously it makes an angle of 90 minus theta with the vertical and the red, the red arrow g vector t is the vertical itself. Okay, so I am going to apply sine law in this triangle now. So, this is a little different to what you may have uh, encountered in your study of projectiles. So, so, just keep following me uh, step by step. So, you will see why I am doing all of this. Alright, so uh, applying sine law here, the sine rule, I will have that V by sine of 90 minus theta, V divided by sine of 90 minus theta should be equal to GT divided by sine phi. So, what I wanted is a relation between the theta and phi. So, basically I get cos theta here is equal to V sin phi by GT. T is the time of flight here. Alright, now why have I done this even in the first place? Because when I write the range, can I write the range as U cos theta, the horizontal component of velocity, multiplied by the time. So I am going to substitute cos theta here. That is why I found out cos theta from this uh, sine law. Alright, so I am going to substitute this value of cos theta here. So, what I will get is uv sin phi by g. You can see the time terms will cancel out. And now we are left with a very simple expression for the range. So, this is actually a, a very neat expression for range uh, uv sin phi by g where phi is remember the angle between the initial velocity vector and final velocity vector. Okay, uh, now it should be very obvious if range is maximum. What will be the value of phi? 90 degrees and that's it. Therefore, my range maximum value would be u v by g. And we also know that this will occur when the angle between the initial and final velocity vector is 90 degrees. So, occurs when u vector is perpendicular to v vector. So, that's just another uh, neat result that we've derived here. Now let's look at the angle at which the particle should be projected in order to maximize this range. So we got that the initial velocity and the final velocity when it's striking the ground are perpendicular to each other. That is what we got. So let's say this angle is theta. So clearly this angle would be 90 minus theta because v and u vector are perpendicular to each other. Now I can just equate the horizontal components of velocity because uh, here there is no acceleration in the horizontal direction. So can I write u cos theta is equal to v cos of 90 minus theta and therefore I have u cos theta is equal to v sin theta and therefore tan theta is equal to u by v. And we already know the final speed because uh, we know the height. I can always write my final speed as u squared plus 2gh. So basically uh, tan theta is u by v is the uh, initial angle of projection such that the horizontal range is maximized. Alright, so this is another pathfinder question that we have here. Looks a little difficult but uh, it's absolutely straightforward once you've, once you've understood whatever we've studied so far. So, I have water flows out in all directions with the same speed from a sprinkler consisting of a perforated spherical shell fixed at the end of a hose. So, basically there is a uh, 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 shell that is emitting water in all directions. When the sprinkler is fixed at the ground, the maximum height attained by a water stream is h. If the sprinkler is shifted to a height h above the ground, by what factor will the watered area on the ground change? So, let us take a look at first what kind of a diagram we can draw for this question. Uh, 
and uh, if you want you can stop the video and try it out on your own okay so first of all when the sprinkler is on the ground level it is ejecting water in all directions including the vertical directions so the water trajectories will be parabolic except one of them which will be vertical which is going straight up so that trajectory will have the vertical trajectory will have the maximum possible height and how much will that be the final velocity at the highest point will be zero so i can simply write v squared is u square minus 2 g h i know v is zero so the initial speed would be equal to 2 g h root of 2 g h right so this is one relation that we are going to use now the sprinkler is shifted to a height h above the ground level and once again you have uh, water being ejected out in all directions with the same speed u as mentioned in the question the question asking find the uh, area on the ground that will be uh, watered by the sprinkler so basically you should be able to see that because it's in all directions there will be a circular region and the radius of that circle will be the maximum possible range of this oblique projectile now we already found out that maximum possible range was equal to u v by g so we know the value of u i can get the value of v and once i get the uh, maximum range i can even get the radius and therefore i can get the area so if you want you can once again pause the video right now and proceed forward with this and get the final answer all right so i'll just do the final calculations i have the maximum range uh, which is the radius of the circle which will be u v by g so this radius would come out to be u is uh, root 2 g h and v would be u squared plus 2 g h so divided by g so i'm going to substitute this u squared as 2 g h so this will come out to be root 8 h and therefore the area that is watered would be pi times this radius squared so that will be 8 pi h squared so this is the area that is watered when the sprinkler is at a height h the original watered area was very simple because it's simply a ground to ground projectile and we know the maximum range will occur at 45 degrees so once again you'll have a circular region which is getting watered and the radius of this will again be the maximum range so the maximum range for a ground to ground projectile would be u square sine 2 theta so that will be sine 90 degree by g so that will be u squared by g and u squared is nothing but 2 gh so that will be 2 h and therefore the area watered would be pi into 2 h the whole squared which would be 4 pi h squared all right so now we need to take the ratio so we already found out that when the sprinkler was at a height h the area watered was 8 pi h squared and when the sprinkler is on the ground we calculated the area to be 4 pi h square and therefore the ratio is 2 is to 1 so that's my answer so i hope you've understood how easily we were able to solve this question uh, provided we know the fact that the maximum range is uv by g so once you know that result these type of questions become uh, extremely easy So suppose I have an inclined plane inclined at an angle alpha let's say and a particle is projected at an angle theta to the incline and I want to find uh, the usual things like time of flight, the range along the incline, the maximum distance along the incline. So uh, let's say this initial launching point is O, let's say this uh, point is P and let me choose my coordinate axis it will be useful to choose my coordinate axis along and perpendicular to the incline so i know my acceleration due to gravity is g downwards so you should be able to see that i can resolve my acceleration as g cos alpha perpendicular to the incline and g sin alpha down the incline 
This is basically just coming from the components of gravity, mg sin alpha and mg cos alpha along and perpendicular to the incline. And let's say the initial speed of the particle is u. So first let me figure out the time of flight. So the time of flight, like I said earlier in this lecture, the time of best way to figure out time of flight is always to look at the displacement. I know that by the time the particle lands on the inclined plane, that is on the x-axis as I've chosen, the displacement y component is zero. So from O to P, the displacement y component is zero. Uyt plus half Ayt square is zero. So I can write my time of flight as uh, minus 2 ui by ay now what is ui that is nothing but u sin theta as we can see from this diagram and what is ay ay is g cos alpha but in the negative y direction so that will be minus g cos alpha and this is your time of flight 2 u sin theta by g cos alpha so this is the time of flight that the particle takes from uh, starting from one point on the incline and landing on the other end of the incline. Another quantity that we can find out is the maximum distance from the incline. So at the maximum distance you should be able to see that the particle uh, velocity will be parallel to the incline so Vy would be 0 and therefore I can use Vy square is Uy square plus 2Ay Sy. Sy will be the maximum distance so let me write that as D. So, I can write uh, ui square is nothing but u square sin square theta, ay is once again uh, minus g cos alpha times d, s y is d and therefore the maximum distance becomes u square sin square theta by 2g cos alpha. Now these two equations or these two expressions uh, will seem a little familiar if you compare it to ground to ground projectile. In ground to ground projectile you had time of flight as 2u sin theta by g. So it's just as if g has been replaced by g cos alpha because that is the acceleration perpendicular to the x-axis. So you can remember it that way. Alright, uh, let's come to range as well. So let me just calculate the range along the incline. So that the le that length is uh, uh, this green length. I want to calculate that range uh, along the incline. So let me just do that on the next page. So my particle starts from this position O, lands at P. Let me just drop a perpendicular. So I'll show you a very quick way of calculating range. Uh, one way is to use the equation of motion S is equal to ut plus half at square. So that is a little long and I would not recommend that. The fastest way to calculate the range is to realize that, see my range is OP. I want to find the range along the incline. Can I write that as OM divided by cos alpha just from this triangle? And what is OM? OM is nothing but the horizontal displacement. So horizontal displacement of projectile motion is very easy to calculate because there is no horizontal acceleration. I can just write OM, the horizontal displacement, as the horizontal component of velocity, not x component. Here x axis is along the incline. X axis is not the horizontal. Horizontal is the uh, line along OM. This is horizontal. Horizontal, the definition of horizontal in physics is perpendicular to gravity. Alright. So, OM is equal to uh, velocity, uh, horizontal component of velocity multiplied by the time of flight. So, what is the horizontal component of velocity? How much is the angle that the initial velocity is making with the horizontal? Theta plus alpha. Second so it U cos of theta plus alpha multiplied by the time of flight. And therefore, my range would be OM divided by cos alpha. So this will be basically U cos of theta plus alpha divided by cos alpha. Now what is the time of flight? We already found that out. 2U sin theta by G cos alpha. So that's it. That's the range. So instead of remembering the formula for the range, I would suggest that you remember the process. It's very straightforward once you understand how to calculate the range from uh, by, by writing down uh, OM, the horizontal displacement first and then taking the range along the incline. So let's also calculate the maximum possible value of this range and let's see at what angle that occurs for a given speed. So let me just do that on the next page. So let me just first write down the expression that we got for range 2u squared sin theta cos of theta plus alpha divided by 
g cos squared alpha. Let me write uh, range using the formula of 2 sin a cos b. So I'm just clubbing 2 sin a cos b as, and then uh, uh, splitting it into two terms using trigonometry. So this will be sine of 2 theta plus alpha minus sin alpha. Now alpha is a constant. What we are doing is we are keeping the speed also as a fixed value. And alpha is the inclination angle which is a constant and I'm going to try and vary theta. Theta is the variable angle that I can throw the projectile at whatever angle I want in order to maximize the range. So you should be able to now recognize that this term is the only term containing theta and for maximum range I will set this to 1. So for r max, for maximum range, I will set that uh, variable term to 1 because that is the maximum value of the sine term and therefore the maximum range will come out to be 1 minus sine alpha and I can just write cos square alpha in the denominator as 1 minus sine square alpha and finally I can just express my maximum range in this manner. Alright, so this is my maximum possible range up the incline. Now. At what angle does this occur? Occurs at uh, occurs when rather 2 theta plus alpha is equal to 90 degree correct. So theta is basically 45 minus alpha by 2. So that is the angle that you need to throw at and uh, if you notice geometrically This angle 45 minus alpha by 2 is the angle at which, at which you need to throw a particle for maximum range. You should be able to see that it is actually the velocity vector is bisecting the angle between the vertical and the inclination. So these two angles are equal. So that's how you can remember the angle. You don't actually have to remember the uh, value. I can just write that the initial velocity bisects the angle between the vertical and the incline for maximum range. Now if I talk about uh, a projectile down the incline. And let's say the angle of projection with the incline is theta. So uh, you can do the same calculations as we did in the previous uh, situation. So you will get the time of flight. I am just going to write down the final expressions because the mathematics is very much the same. So time of flight is the same as, down, uh, as up the incline. The maximum distance is also the same. The only change comes in the range. The range here instead of cos of theta plus alpha, you have to just simply replace alpha by minus alpha. And I am going from up the incline to down the incline. I will just explain physically why that happens but let me just first write down the expression for the range. And the maximum value of the range we found out for up the incline was u square by g times 1 plus sin alpha. Now it will become 1 minus sin alpha. And once again the maximum range will occur when the projectile is thrown at an angle of 45 plus alpha by 2 this time. Previously it was minus alpha by 2. Now it will occur at plus alpha by 2. Once again the uh, you should be able to see that the initial velocity vector is going to bisect the angle between the vertical and the incline. So this angle is going to be bisected by the initial velocity vector when the range is maximized. Alright, so these are the expressions. Let me just tell you physically why uh, the relation between up the incline and down the incline is simply replacing alpha by minus alpha. The reason is for down the incline, I will take my x-axis as downwards. 
So all I have done is changed the uh, choice of my x-axis, x-axis that I had chosen positive as upwards and up the incline on the previous page. Now I have chosen as a downwards. So, so the only thing that is going to change is ax which was minus g sin alpha for up the incline along the x-axis. Now it will be plus g sin alpha because down the incline is basically our positive x-axis. So effectively I've just replaced uh, sin alpha by minus sin alpha, but Ay will still remain g cos alpha with a negative sign, whether it's up the incline or down the incline. And therefore, you should be able to see that we only changed the sign of sin alpha while keeping cos alpha the same. So trigonometrically, that means we've just replaced alpha by minus alpha. That's why all the expressions in up the incline, if you just replace alpha by minus alpha, you'll get all the expressions for down the incline. Alright, now let's look at a few questions based on inclined plane projectile. So let's read this question. Uh, two inclined planes OA and OB having inclination with the horizontal 30 and 60 respectively intersect each other at O. So I have two planes OA and OB. Their angles are 30 and 60 with the horizontal. A uh, particle is projected from point P with a velocity 10 root 3 meter per second along a direction perpendicular to the plane OA. So perpendicular to OA, a particle is projected. And the particle strikes the other plane OB perpendicularly at Q. So uh, the particle is being projected here and it is striking again perpendicularly. Calculate uh, the vertical height of P from O. Alright, so uh, I have my projectile in this manner. And I want to calculate um, the vertical height H of point P. So in such questions in inclined plane projectiles, usually it is preferable to choose first of all my origin at the point of launching and then take the x-axis and y-axis. You can take the x-axis along the incline. I'm taking x-axis along the incline and y-axis perpendicular to the incline. You can, you can do the opposite also. It won't make a difference. So first thing, let me just write down the initial velocity vector and acceleration vector. Can I say initial velocity vector is simply u j cap. There is no x component. And the acceleration vector, if I resolve it along the x-axis and y-axis as I have chosen, the x-axis is at 30 degrees to the horizontal. I have taken downward x-axis as positive, so that will be g sin 30 i cap minus g cos 30 j cap. Because the acceleration g vector would be this way. Its components would be g cos 30 and g sin 30 g cos 30 is along the negative y axis which is why I have a negative sign here. So this will simply become g by 2 i cap minus g root 3 by 2 j cap. Alright, now that I have the initial velocity and acceleration vector, now let's look at what information is given to us. It says that the particle strikes plane OB perpendicularly. So in which direction is the particle's velocity when it strikes plane OB? It is striking in a direction which is parallel to the x-axis and that means which components value do I know of the velocity at the point of striking? Not the x-axis, I know the y component. I know vy is 0 because the velocity is entirely along the x-axis. So one information that I have is vy is 0 and because vy is 0, I can get the time uy plus ay t is 0. So what is ui? u, what is ay? Minus g root 3 by 2. And therefore I get the time. Now what will I do with this time? I will calculate the displacement. See in the question they are asking you the height. Height means something has to be related to displacement. We have to relate height to some component of displacement. So if I look at the diagram, so let me just erase the gravity components. Alright, so now if I just look at this diagram, my displacement vector is from P to Q. This is my displacement vector. Now, can I somehow relate this displacement vector to height? See, I know that uh, this, this length here that I have drawn here, the pink length, is my height h. And let's say this red length, the red portion that I am drawing, that is nothing but the displacement x component. You should be able to see that. That is a component of the displacement vector along the x-axis. And in this triangle, 
you should be able to see that h is nothing but sx sin 30. So all I need is sx. How will I calculate the x component of the displacement? Use the second equation because I already know the time. So what is the initial, uh, basically I can write sx as uxt plus half axt squared into sin 30 which is half. And what is ux? Zero. Initial velocity is only along the j cap. I will simply be half ax. What is ax? g by 2 into t squared multiplied by sin 30 which is half. And that is it. So you will get your uh, height as u squared by 6g. And then you can just substitute the value of um, u as 10 root 3 and g as 10 to get your value of height as 5 meters. So that is your answer and um, I hope you have understood how we were able to solve this question. See you have to just read the question very carefully and figure out the information. Often when the question says that it strikes perpendicularly that means the component, uh, one of the components is known to us which is 0. In this case the particle was striking the plane OB. Perpendicularly means its velocity was along the x-axis. So y component is 0 and uh, look at what is asked in the question. If they ask you something like height or some length that means you need to figure out some displacement. So the common equations um, having velocity as well as displacement would be the ones involving time. You get the time from one information and use the time in the other equation. That is how you solve majority of the inclined plane questions. Alright, let's do another question. So I have a boy throws a ball so as to clear a wall of height h and at a distance x from him. Find the minimum speed of the ball to clear the wall. So uh, in this question it is assumed that we are throwing the ball from ground level and let us say there is some wall here of height uh, h and distance x from the boy. And this is how the projectile will go. It will just graze the top of the wall because the question is asking us to find the minimum speed. Alright, so if you want you can pause the video and try it out. You will actually have, uh, there is actually two methods to do this. One is using the equation of trajectory and the other the shorter method, the cuter method is using the inclined plane projectile results. So whichever way you try it out if you want and then you can take a look at my solution. Right, so uh, the standard method or the longer method if you wish, I can write the equation of trajectory. So let us say the speed here is u at an angle theta. So the angle theta and u are both variables. We do not, uh, we, we are free to choose theta in order to minimize the speed required. So what I can do is I can use the equation of trajectory. And the height is h, the x coordinate is x from the point of launching. So let me just take the point of launching as my origin and the vertical as the y axis and the horizontal as the x axis. So I can write h, the y coordinate is equal to x tan theta minus gx squared by 2u squared cos square theta. From here on you can get, you can get find u as a function of theta and then get the minima of u. So a little bit of calculus, you should be able to do it, it is not too difficult but uh, that is one method. The other method in the standard method itself, the other way is to uh, get a quadratic in tan theta. So once you get a quadratic in tan theta, I mean you, you can basically write cos square theta as uh, sec square in the numerator and then 1 plus tan square and then in quadratic in theta and then uh, set the discriminant greater than or equal to 0. So you will get an inequality, you will get u greater than or equal to something that will be your minimum value. So these are two uh, methods or rather uh, two ways to do using the equation of trajectory. Well, let me show you the fastest method. Uh, uh, so I am not doing the actual calculations for these, you can try it out on your own. But let me just go to the next page and show you the fastest method for this. So I have the wall of height h 
and from a distance x a ball is projected so if i were to just draw an imaginary inclined plane connecting the initial position of launching to the top of the wall i can treat the motion as motion on an inclined plane and we already know the maximum range so for the minimum speed i would like i basically want to find the optimal speed the most efficient way of throwing will be to maximize the range will be to throw the ball at an angle such that the range is maximized for a given speed so if i'll just write this as o let's say this is p o p is my range there is nothing but root of x square plus x square and projectile up the incline we already know that the maximum range was u square divided by g into 1 plus sin alpha from this equation here and now it's very simple we are done here because i know that u square is equal to g into 1 plus sin alpha times root of x square plus x square what is sin alpha sin alpha from this triangle is nothing but h divided by root of x square plus x square and therefore i will have uh, u squared is equal to g times root of x square plus x square plus h so that's it that is your uh, value of u squared of course you can just take the root finally to get the value of uh, the speed so this is your minimum speed all right let's do another question suppose i have an inclined wall and let's say this inclination is at 15 degrees to the horizontal and uh, at a distance of 10 meters i have a particle projected with speed 10 meter per second so the question is asking us to find theta such that the particle that is launched just grazes the wall and we can take g as 10 meter per second squared so if you want you can give it a try use uh, the concepts that you studied from inclined plane projectile give it a try and then you can have a look at my solution all right so the best way to do this type of question would be to choose an axis along and parallel to the incline this is my incline see i need my projectile to just graze the uh, ball that is what the question is asking us so what i'm going to do is i'm going to select my axis this is my x axis parallel to the incline and this is my axis y axis perpendicular to the incline the reason i'm selecting it this way is because when the particle is grazing the wall that means it is at the maximum distance from the x axis from this imaginary incline plane this distance will be its maximum distance where the velocity will only be in the x direction vy would be zero so let's say that distance maximum distance is d if i have velocity u and this angle the x axis parallel to the incline so this angle would be uh, 15 degrees and let's say the angle of the uh, velocity initial velocity with the x axis is 5 so we need to find uh, 5 plus 15 degrees that is going to be my final answer so we've already seen the expression for the maximum distance from the incline plane this expression u square sin square theta by 2g cos alpha here alpha in our question would be 15 degrees and theta would basically be 5 so my maximum distance would be u square sin square 5 by 2g cos alpha alpha would be 15 degrees now what is the maximum distance here the maximum distance see would would basically be this distance and i know this is 15 degrees i know this length is given to be 10 meters 
So this maximum distance, can you see, would be 10 sin 15 degree. And that's it. So I'm just going to substitute d as 10 sin 15 is equal to u squared sin squared phi divided by 2g cos 15. And that's it. So I'll have sin square phi as um, 10g times 2 sin 15 cos 15. I can just write it as sin 30 divided by u squared. So u is 10 meter per second and therefore uh, 10g by u squared will simply become 1 by substituting g as 10 and u as 10. And therefore I will have sin square 5 is sin 30 and therefore uh, phi is 45 degrees. And what is my answer? I need theta with the horizontal, the initial velocity angle with the horizontal. So that angle theta would be 5 plus 15 degrees. So that is 60 degrees. So that's my answer. So I hope you understood how we use the concept of inclined plane. Basically, I drew an imaginary inclined plane here parallel to the wall. And uh, I got the angle that the initial velocity makes, makes with the horizontal.